Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for the panel PhD to Entrepreneur, Building and Managing a Deep Tech Startup. I hope you are all safe and sound due, during these very hard days. Uh, I'm Gislaine Silveira, and I am uh, responsible for the New York City Hub uh, I'm starting one more District 3 Dialogues, a series made to bring inspiration, tools, information, connections, but also um, good vibes in these very hard and difficult times. For those who don't know, we are District 3, um, an university-based accelerator in Montreal, a very active and leading innovation center in the city, who has been worked almost seven years now, uh, providing startups with different programs and services along their uh, journey. So we have one-on-one -on -one coaching, mentoring, uh, global expansion, seed fund opportunities for these startups. We have helped more than 500 startups and at any time you can be part of our team by applying to our validation and launch and grow programs. Uh, at District 3, we have always embraced scientific entrepreneurship as a realistic and viable career for many PhD graduate students. District 3 um, always embraced these PhD graduates in our standard programs, validation, launch, and grow, but also in very specific activities like the Quebec Scientific Entrepreneurship Program, which is an online lab to market activity and curriculum to help uh, build world changing tech companies derived from academic research. And this is exactly what we will talk about today, about this very powerful intersection between research and entrepreneurship. We, we will talk about how this can shape individuals future but also the economy and our society um, as, uh, environment as well. More precisely, we will talk to PhD students who are com completing their, their research at this moment and they want to harness this expertise or their expertise to start a company. We will also talk to those who who are already scientific entrepreneurs and want insights how they can take their companies to, to the next level. Um, to talk about this, we will have today our head coach at District 3, J.D. Bejean, uh, who will lead the discussion. J.D., he works with our startups, helping them to find the product market fit, uh, also grow their key business metrics and secure financing uh, along their journey. JD, he will talk to Fernando Gomes Vaquero, who I have the pleasure to know from the ecosystem here in New York City. Fernando, he's a PhD. He's the director of runway and spin out programs at Jacobs Technion Cornell Institute at Cornell Tech, which is an amazing space here in Manhattan. He will talk more about this. Um, and he's based in New York. Fernando, he's also an entrepreneur. He's the CEO and founder of uh, Bistec. Uh, it's very experienced mentors for scientific entrepreneurs, JD and Fernando. They will talk about this journey breaking out uh, of the lab. They will also talk about how um, research-based startups can develop, grow, expand their business. And also, of course, based on their expertise and experience, how they are mentoring and advising startups to overcome the challenges of this very particular moment. Uh, JD and Fernando, they will talk for 40 minutes, uh, followed by a 10, 15 minutes of Q&A. At any moment, you can participate by adding your comments and also your questions at the very bottom uh, of your screen. And we'll be more than, than keen on uh, replying to them. Uh, also, don't forget to go to our website, district, uh, d3center.ca. Apply for our newsletter to um, keep yourself informed about our district three dialogues and other events. Next week, 
For example, we will have a very interesting chat with Dr. Uh, Camille Delabac, who's also based in New York, uh, and he will talk about this beautiful future between biotechnology and entrepreneurship. So join us next week as well. Without further ado, uh, I would like to thank you, Fernando, for being today with us. JD, to wish you a wonderful discussion with uh, Dr. Fer uh, Fernando Gomes Paquero. And uh, we will start by showing you a video about uh, Cornell Tech and the programs that they host in, in New York. So wish you a wonderful panel. From academia to the real world is very challenging. My PhD was an amazing experience for me, but at some point I felt that all the work is being summarized into an article that you publish. Runway was a really great bridge, one foot in academia and one foot in industry. At the end, you are building a business. It is not a research project. An article is not enough. You need to bring it to the market. With the Runway program at Jacobs Institute, they taught me how you can turn a PhD into a CEO, which not only has the toolbox to build the product, but also go-to-market strategy, product market fit, and many other things that as an academic you don't think about at all. One of the unique things about the portfolio companies of the Runway program, every single one of them has been built on a very deep technology that is incredibly hard to replicate and it needs its own special type of support to build and scale. Innovating in the healthcare industry is very challenging. Hospitals tend to use technology that they're familiar with and they also change very slowly. Being at the Jacobs Institute allowed us to start those pilots and engagements with hospitals. One of the major benefits in the runway program is the access to very experienced mentors. The president of the Technion is one of the founders of Sleep Medicine. It really helped connect me to top researchers in this field to create this valuable position from bottom up. We launched from the runway program in 2016. We built out a minimum viable product, which we implemented in five hospitals. We are now working to prepare the product for our FDA submission. Today we're selling all of America in all major channels. We hit a major milestone. We're operating in eight different states and collected over 100 million square foot worth of construction data. At some point you need to have your wings this is your company. Maybe this is why you call it a runway. You know, it's a runway and then the end you need to fly. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Gislan. Uh, great to meet you, Fernando. Um, Thank you. I'm, I'm interested to start actually with, uh, you know, maybe at a high level, just getting an understanding. I'm quite familiar with Cornell University uh, to, you know, which has been around forever. Um, yep, <laughs> since, I, since uh, 1865, right. so exactly. uh, my, a lot of years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah my, my, uh, my uncle actually studied there, uh, you know, I think 50 years ago. And uh, so, um, and I saw a lot of uh, news release and articles about the uh, Jacobs Technum Cornell Institute. Uh, mm -hmm. So maybe we could just start there, uh, you know, Cornell University, then how does uh, uh, Jacobs uh, Institute fit in there? And then, you know, just give us how Runway fits into the piece of the puzzle. Um, yeah, sure. No, that's a great question. And again, thank you for having me. Thank you, everybody that, is, that, that joined. Um, so, you know, the story of how this, this campus came to be and the Jacobs Institute came to be uh, has a couple of, uh, I think, interesting components. So one that was, it's a big component is, uh, there's an economic development play behind uh, the creation of the Jacobs Institute and, and Cornell Tech. And is you know, 10 years ago, entrepreneurship did not look the same way that it does right now in New York. Uh, we, um, I think uh, Michael Bloomberg was mayor at that point in time. There was a realization that uh, actually entrepreneurship wasn't that great. <laughs> you know, Silicon Valley was doing much better. And I think you could, there's a lot of cities that can relate to this. Uh, what I really liked about that was that they said, no, we're honest, that uh, we need to do something different and we need to put some effort into this. So Cornell Tech was built as a economic development play for the city of New York. And so the idea was that a university would come and set up an operation that wasn't really focused on just the academic side. The academic, it's, it's an important component, but it's really focused on creating companies. So our goal as Cornell Tech, which is the whole campus, 
is uh, for for us to become uh, this uh, entrepreneurship on steroids creator uh, of companies in New York, and by doing that, creating economic growth. Uh, so, so that's an important component of it. Uh, but then it came the realization that okay, Cornell, it's again, it's an old university, and to be honest, uh, you know, there's a lot that that we could do better as a university to to create better uh, better entrepreneurship. And universities are big and have done entrepreneurship before, but uh, they also have a lot of things that they do that I think they, they counter and they hinder uh, the, the, the creation of, of startups. You know, there's a lot of issues. So there was this idea of why don't we build a uh, sort of a, a, a little island uh, that could be an experimentation place for entrepreneurship. That could be this place where we really take some bold steps from the academic environment to teach, uh, to, to, to just do interesting stuff. Uh, and, and again, there was a very honest thing of saying, maybe we don't know everything, right? So maybe we should bring a partner to do this. And Technion was a great partner. You know, Startup Nation has a lot of uh, uh, knowledge and a lot of history in building companies or great entrepreneurs there. Uh, what they lack is the market, right? So it's an $8 million country, it's sorry, 8 million people country. So it's small. So they like the market access, but they have a lot of knowledge and entrepreneurship. We in New York have the market. It's a huge market, great entry point to the United States, and we wanted to learn from them. So the Jacobs Institute became this collaboration between Cornell and Technion, so two amazing academic institutions, uh, to really um, do something different in terms of entrepreneurship. Uh, and because just because Cornell comes to a place doesn't mean that it's going to change all the policies, right? So we needed that additional space. And Runway was that first experiment. It's not the only experiment that we've done. Uh, and actually, we've done some that have failed spectacularly, which is great, right? So that's all part of entrepreneurship. Uh, but Runway has been one of those experiments that has actually succeeded. And the experiment um, was rather simple. It was uh, a professor at Technion said, look, we have this population of people that are uh, postdocs and, and, and people that are just graduating from PhDs or that, are, that are, have done their PhDs they're like in the last year and they are always very involved in the tech transfer uh, in, in universities and I'm pretty sure that a lot of people that are attending today see themselves like that you know I'm either finishing my PhD or I'm a postdoc I'm heavy on trying to commercialize the technology but the, re the realization is we're just not helping them the right way. You know, some, they, they have these disincentives. On one side, if they're pretty good, sometimes professors are telling them, oh, you should be in academia. And they're saying, well, I don't want to be in academia. And there might not be enough jobs in academia. So that's just the reality. On the other hand, if they go out there and they say, I want to commercialize this, this is a company that I really believe in, then uh, they're seen as CTOs. Why? Because they have the technical knowledge, but they don't have the business knowledge. So what we said is, that's not your fault. That's our fault, right? That's the academic fault because we are not serving you the right way. And the idea was to bring people that are in that space that have PhDs or just recently graduated from PhDs and serve them the right way. And serving them the right way means putting them 100% of the time to work on their own companies, uh, giving them all of the tools and resources to create their own intellectual property and their company, actually investing in them. So giving them money and resources, real money, uh, and, uh, um, and really just saying, you know, you, we understand that you don't know how to do this. And that is the starting point. So we don't want people that have done it before. We're not looking for big companies. We're looking for that entrepreneur, that PhD that has no idea what to do. That it's our, our sweet spot is the people that are saying like, oh my God, I don't know what to do. So, and where, and, where, and, where do you pick them up typically in the journey? Yeah. So we usually pick them up when they are finishing their PhDs. Uh, they've already had some, um, you know, usually these people have already uh, done some work trying to commercialize the technology. Uh, a lot of the ones that we get that I think are, are pretty good are the ones that have tried to either do uh, an NSF program like an i program or some commercialization program. Uh, but it's very different doing those programs, which are a little bit, you know, here and there that to do it full time. Um, and we pick them up from all over the world. So one of the, um, I guess it was the greatest thing of, of my job before pandemic was that I got, I had to uh, fly all over the world uh, trying to figure out where the best people came. And I can tell you, uh, they come from anywhere. 
So uh, we've gotten people from, obviously a lot from Israel, a lot from the US, but we've gotten people from India, from Europe, uh, from China, uh, from Iran, uh, and also from the Middle East. It's, there's tons of people out there in the world and we're open, you know, anyone um, can join this program as long as they finish their PhD. And, and can you describe the curriculum? So, you know, you finish your PhD, yeah. um, so you apply, uh, you know, is it, uh, um, how many people apply? How many do you take? What are the criteria? Yeah, so we, uh, we have had uh, over the last couple of years about 40 applications. Uh, we only take four people. And, uh, and I, I'm working really hard to take more, <laughs> which is just a function of money, to be honest. Uh, and, and we're pretty selective with the people that, that we bring. And what we really want is uh, a couple of things that you, uh, I think, might find very reasonable. One is that they actually are pretty good in the academic sense. So we, we know that you're pretty good in academia, but you're here in business and we want to bring you up in business too. So, but you need to be very good at academia. So uh, we want people like that. We take a look at personality too, a lot. Uh, just because you have a PhD doesn't mean that you, know, you, you have the personality to be a, a good CEO and not all PhDs would make good CEOs and that's perfectly fine. You know, that's, 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 but we want to give the opportunity to those that have that combination of so, um, so we take a look at the personality a lot. We take obviously a look at what is it that they want to do and not that it needs to be uh, super well thought out because we know that it won't be, uh, but at least it needs to be an interesting topic, right? So and, I, and, you know, if, I, if I can interrupt you a second, I'm super interested to see, yeah. you know, what are the personality traits that are, you know, no goes yeah. or, or, you know, like what makes it a 10 out of 10 in terms of personality trait and, and what, what's an absolute negative. <laughs> yeah. You don't that mind is, sharing. Yeah. No, not at all. Not at all. And, and you know, they, this uh, it's very nuanced and uh, actually it comes from my own experience. You know, I, I am this person or I, you know, I am a P, the PhD that um, I, th I think one of the, one of the key things, uh, and I always tell the entrepreneurs is whenever someone tells me that they're frustrated, I think that that is a good indication, right? So it's these PhDs that are frustrated, like I'm frustrated with academia, I'm frustrated with not being able to make an impact. It's so frustration, I feel is one of those like plus, you know, when someone is, is really frustrated by not being able to solve a problem. Uh, or go beyond just uh, the, the academic environment, uh, that's a great indication. So um, the other one, re, to, totally, total restlessness is amazing. So, and, and we're like that, you know, it's the energy, you can feel it. Uh, that is like, I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna stay still. The other one, which is a, a 10 out of 10, I think, you know, this is really the biggest indicator is someone that basically says, uh, so like, screw you, if you don't want to give me this, I'll still do it by myself, <laughs> right? So if, if, if someone says, I'll do it whether you like me or not, whether you support me or not, that is a great indication. And that is really what entrepreneurs do all the time, right? Um, so, and, and those are good, you know, the, the, the things that normally in academia are like taboo when you're saying, oh, I'm frustrated, I don't like academia. Uh, are the things that we love. Are the <laughs> so it's the completely opposite is just we really do it for those people saying, no, there's something wrong with this. I want to explore and just, and just do this uh, by myself. Uh, things that might be of detriment. And, and I think that uh, I just always tell uh, entrepreneurs and the people that are trying to do this to be very honest with themselves. So if what they really see themselves doing and what they like is the academic sort of track, you know, to publishing and being a professor and doing that, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And, but be honest with that. So we don't want people that are just doing this to get a postdoc and then go to academia. We're doing this actually to open the possibility to other careers, right? If after, you have, if after giving the best effort on that, they decide to go back to academia, that's one thing. But someone that just says, well, I'm doing this because uh, I just want to give this a try before becoming a professor. No, that's not what we want, right? So we want a person that is going to be full on on this. Um, but you know, it, that is in itself, it's, it's, I think it's a very interesting question because it's very difficult to recognize entrepreneurs and I feel that sometimes it takes entrepreneurs to recognize entrepreneurs. So kind of you, you build your tribe and you start to see people. 
uh, and uh, and all of a sudden it kind of clicks, right? Who's who's doing this? What, what, what do you think about? I mean, a subject that I find interesting is you know sometimes self confidence can be construed as cockiness. So yeah. you know I've sometimes been in meetings where you know I absolutely love the entrepreneurs because you know he had some level. You want some level level of stubbornness, but yeah. yet not too much. And, you know, but some people can deal with that. And we say, you know, he's uncoachable. I'm not going to be able to mentor him. So, you know, how do you see this, this balance between, you know, having someone with good self-confidence, but at the same time, having someone whom you can coach? Yeah, that, that's exactly the point. I mean, coachability is the other big thing. And we talk a lot about coachability uh, of these people. And you, uh, I mean, the bad, bad part about that is that you don't know until you actually work for a long time with someone. So... Uh, I personally try to get to meet people and understand how they work and help them even before they apply to the program so that I can know if they're coachable or not. So um, for the most part, you know, I, uh, <laughs> we, we have this uh, code, uh, which is sort of like this uh, entrepreneurship way of doing things. And one of our, one of our lines in, on our code is don't be a jerk. Right. So, and because uh, I think that that's very pervasive right now in, in technology, uh, but I think it's not necessary. We know it's not necessary. So as long as people are not really doing it uh, because, again, they're being a jerk, is there's a level of confidence that is good. There's a level of directness that we actually love. And this is especially um uh, seen, we see this especially in Israelis, which I really like, is it's hyper direct, right? Uh, and, and I like that, you know, and mm -hmm. as long as it is, is not to be a jerk, it's really to advance what you're trying to do, is really to save time and just to cut, cut to the chase. And, and you're also as an entrepreneur taking the information and actually making changes with the information that you get with the information, we're all good, right? So, but that's where coachability comes in. You're right. That's key absolutely key uh, and we don't have any particular metric of it it's just we really like sit down and try to figure out okay do, do we feel that this person is coachable or not so yeah if anyone here has a measure of coachability please send that to me <laughs> i would love to learn yeah <laughs> so, so 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 you know we have uh this entrepreneur uh you know this uh phd team of researchers from montreal who get accepted yeah. into uh the runway program what happens next uh, so, um, well, I, I think right now, well, well, first is a little bit what happens, uh, what happens just before, right? So one of the interesting things about the runway program is also we, we want to make you independent. We want to make all of these entrepreneurs independent and realize that building a company, first off, requires 100% of the time. And second, it requires you to break that, um, that power relationship that you have with your advisor. Uh, and that's good, you know, advisors initially don't understand it, but as they go through with us, they, they understand how that works better. And is uh, once you come to our program, we basically say you are independent, you're on your own, you're not working for anyone, you're just working for yourself. And you should, with the knowledge that you have, you should be able to create new IP, you should be able to protect that new IP, you should be able to handle all of the strategy part of this. So we dive in initially into a curriculum, which you had asked before, uh, a curriculum that tries to uh, really get people up to speed in some things that normally PhDs, uh, we don't know, right? Um, and, and basic things could be, you know, sort of like how to establish a company, how to do all of the paperwork, uh, how to pay people, uh, what the different types of uh, financial instruments for companies are. Uh, so those are you know, just things that we don't necessarily, uh, you know, we're not born knowing. So we obviously give that information, but there are some other things that we also work a lot on and is uh, leadership and decision-making uh, of entrepreneurs, particularly PhDs uh, suffer a lot from what it's called, or we call analysis paralysis. We have so much information that we're so sort of paralyzed and don't know how to, how to process and do something with it. That is horrible. You know, if you're doing a PhD, you take six years, that might be okay uh, for a couple of months. For an uh, entrepreneurship, that is a no-no. So uh, we take a look at uh, effect, effective decision-making, leadership, team building. Uh, we get executive coaches to work with people. Uh, we even get actors to help people you know, <laughs> just talk better, be more motivated. 
um, and uh, and we try to fill in those gaps. Um, and and at the end, it's just giving. It, there is a, there is a part of it that I feel that for PhDs is um, is generalized. So generally, uh, PhDs don't know that much about financial instruments for companies and all of that stuff. That's fine. But then there's a lot of stuff that is personalized. So each case is different. They would need different types of training. Uh, and and we're very mindful and, uh, and and try to really bring that to people. Um, yeah. So so how do you go about helping them validate that what they're working on actually has a market? Yeah. So and and this is a recommendation for everybody. Is uh, the first thing that we say is uh, stop coding. So <laughs> that is you you don't know what you're supposed to code until you go out there and talk to customers and and see what the value proposition is. So we talk a lot about validating that value proposition and and finding before even finding the uh, the, the, well, it's part of finding the product market fit. Um, but it's just pushing it out there, out there and say, okay, go to your customer, talk to them, figure out what, what is the real value there? What's the problem? What is the real value that needs to be solved? And once you have that very clear and you understand that there are customers out there and this is reproducible and this is scalable too, then you can start coding and then you can start doing the work. So we sort of like flip it and a lot of entrepreneurs, um, the first thing that they do is they get out and we make a lot of connections with potential potential customers with, I don't know if it's in healthcare, it would be with hospitals. If it's in cybersecurity, it might be financial institutions. Uh, so whatever they need uh, to make that. Uh, but I think so, that a good so, general recommendation is like put the code down. Yeah, yeah and, and you generally open the doors for them or uh, have them uh, find the right doors and open them up and connect with the people behind. Yeah, so we we open all of the doors. I think that we uh, like th there is my my sort of like uh, approach to this and maybe goal in life is uh, not only to open the door, but once I open it, to actually like remove the lock. You know, <laughs> so so basically, I uh, meaning meaning that meaning that I I just try to make sure that everybody gets access to everything, right? So yeah. we'll remove uh, the door altogether. <laughs> yeah, yeah, remove the door exactly. So that 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 is even better. I'm not even going down that far. And so uh, no, but but that's the point. I think we have uh, like what one of the things that we notice is our community is amazing and it's super helpful. And and part of also the collaboration, which is the Jacobs Institute, is not just Technion and Cornell. It's really this whole community of people in, in New York, in the Northeast, and in Israel that come together and say, you know, it feels like this is a home for all of us, it's a home for ideas, and they approach us. And uh, the greatest thing also about how we've done it, and, and uh, this uh, it, it was really possible because of the gift of the Jacobs family, uh, John and Erwin Jacobs, is that because we're philanthropically funded, then we don't have to restrict access to anyone. It's basically come and see what's happening, come and talk to the people. Um, and I just, uh, you know, part, part also of doing this conversation is to tell the people that are here right now is, uh, you know, you have a group of people in us that we want to be your community too. You know, so I'm opening up the door here and then, you know, I took the door out, the lockout, and then we'll, we'll work <laughs> on the door too. Uh, but it, it really is that is, uh, find, find the people around you like us that well, all that we want to do is keep those, those, those doors open and help out as much as we can. And sometimes we can help a lot. Sometimes we can't. Uh, mm. And uh, I think that's the other thing that we're pretty honest with. And this is also part of the uh, of the selection process, uh, which I think all of all of entrepreneurs should also push for is if we are not the right place for an entrepreneur, we shouldn't be bringing someone. And and you have to be honest with that. And I feel that sometimes we get these. Um, uh, these uh, accelerator programs, not gonna name names, maybe I will, uh, that, that is basically just like a, a black hole. They're just like, oh, everybody needs to come in this way. No, not everybody needs to come our way. I think that uh, there's lots of interesting people out there that can help you. And if we're a good home, then that's awesome and we can help you. I think that that sets you up for success. But if there's a better home for you, we should be able to help you find that better home. Um, so that's also important. And so how long does the program last? Or is, that, is there a length of program? So we get into runway, 
how long are we typically going to be there as an as a startup? Yeah, so usually, um, so the the program can be up to two years, uh, but if I'm doing my job correctly, then it shouldn't be two years. So, and and uh, we really try to push people to finish faster than that. For we've had really, um, you know, our companies get funded uh, by angel investing. So we have like a medium of uh, 700K investment from angels to, to our companies, in addition to what we give them, uh, which is $300,000. Um, and they get that in about a year and a couple of months. So uh, once they have that, they could be operating by themselves. And then in about two years, they get their series seed, which is two, two and a half million. Uh, so I think that most companies buy well, so, so there's, there's a clear point, I think, in one year. So in one year, we sit down and we say, okay, is this a research project or is this a company? So if this is a research project, so it's been a good effort, but goodbye, right? So we need to kill it, <laughs> right? Uh, so, you, so your yeah. line in the sand is uh, first round of funding. No, I mean, we give, fund, we, we give funding. So we give our own funding. Right. And we don't uh, we know that it's going to take time for the people to come in. You could be at a year and not have any other funding, but but this could be very clearly a company and we will continue to support you and to fund you. So it's not really about the funding. It's about whether it, it, it is actually something that is driven by uh, by a commercial application that is solving a problem and is giving value to someone. If it's just something that that is becoming yeah, too academic or too paper, uh, look, I mean, we Cornell does it and Tengen does it. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, we, we, can, we can foster that you can continue doing it somewhere else. Uh, but for us, that's not the goal. The goal is to really build companies. So if it looks like a company, if it smells like a company, it looks like a company, <laughs> then we will continue supporting it. Uh, and funding will come. Uh, if, if that is the case, funding will come. But also, we you know, we also want to uh, set a, a a time where you have you make a decision also of stopping something that is not going the way that it should be going, and I think that that's very important. We get, um, I uh, actually Bestic is not the only company that I built. I built seven other companies, and uh, and a lot of those I think I should have ended earlier. Uh, and I didn't, and that's a lesson learned. So we also want to have people say, uh, with information, with data, with the right, right work, just say, okay, we should end this. And that's a great decision to end something, mm -hmm. right? You don't waste money, you don't waste time, you don't waste effort, you don't waste people's time. Um, so that's, that's a big part of that inflection point. So I think one year is enough for you to know. Uh, I was I was curious. Uh, one of the entrepreneurs in the video we played uh, mentioned that uh, deep tech uh, startups have requires special type of support, and um, I'm really curious to have you expand on that. You know, what how yeah. does deep tech differ uh, from the type of support that's required from a uh, you know typical uh, startup? Yeah, so I think we separate into two two types of tech, you know, and it could be deep, but it, there's hardware and software. So we are focused on software or digital. Uh, there's wonderful programs on that are more focused on hardware. Uh, I I can recommend Cyclotron Road, for example, that, down in, in Berkeley, National Labs, uh, Activate at MIT. They're wonderful. They're friends, you know, so we, I, I, again, we share resources and we talk to everybody. Um, but we really focus on um, on software, and I think that for software, um, the resources that you need are, are simpler, right? So are more intellectual, are a little bit more telecommunications, having storage. Uh, we have partners like AWS, Google on their cloud services, Azure, um, and those are the types of partnerships that you need. So it's really not that complicated. We have done some IoT devices, which is on the video, and so we have a small maker lab, um, uh, but uh, we also let people say, well, whenever you're growing a little bit more, you can use New York has all of those resources. So we also don't see any need to invest a whole bunch of money in something that already exists in New York. Uh, so yeah, you definitely need to have, uh, so for software, the good thing I think is that you need to have is a lot of intellectual um, uh, support and intellectual resources, meaning that you should have tons of mentors. 
Uh, and we, we always think about four types of mentors. Uh, one is your academic mentor, so someone that knows technology and, and, uh, and, and where it is and where it stands in the world. A, uh, then industry mentor, someone that knows that industry. Uh, a VC mentor, so obviously someone that knows the finance part of things. Uh, and the last one that I really like is just a very, um, the practical entrepreneur mentor. And is someone that is basically just telling our entrepreneurs, okay, don't be stupid. This is not as complicated. Just get it done, right? It's someone that is very practical. So that's those are mainly the the resources that we need is great mentoring resources. Um, but if you if you need hardware too, there are some programs that have built that. And mostly what they're trying to do right now is work with national labs, and we work on the healthcare side with some uh, city funded labs, uh, yeah, for for health technologies. And, and as an entrepreneur, when I join the program, how many mentors do I have access to? Uh, well, yeah, it's a, it's a long list. So, okay. I mean, it really is, uh, I, I, I think that any, we really try to have a, those four, right? So those four, at least, uh, we have a long list, but there's a rotation because at the beginning, you don't, you don't know exactly what is it that you need. And there's also some personality matching there. So I think at the end, as entrepreneurs go, they really end up tying themselves to two or three mentor stops. Uh, also because there's not enough time, there's some people that, that you like, like rather than other people. So, uh, yeah, we, we tend to get them, uh, at least four initially, and then they, they end up really time to, um, two or three. And these mentors sometimes become investors too. So, um, which we like, that's perfectly fine. Um, uh, so just switch, switching gears a bit, I uh, wanted to ask you this initially. So how do we go to being a uh, undergrad in economics to doing a PhD in nanoscale engineering? So I thought that was a, uh, that was a curious pivot. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, uh, that's the question that my family always asked me, you know, down the, <laughs> down the line. Um, it, it was, uh, you know, frustration and unconformity, uh, to be, to be perfectly honest. I, uh, I, when, when I was doing my, my undergrad, actually it was economics and also industrial engineering. And so it was really focused on finance. And most of my friends are bankers. And I just never liked that life. You know, never really saw myself working at a bank. Um, industrial engineering has some areas like of manufacturing. I thought that that was, that was a little bit more interesting. Uh, but to me, um, the, the key thing was uh, my mother um, uh, is... Is a chemist, is retired now, but she was a professor for uh, for 30 years and a researcher, wonderful researcher, and uh, and she introduced me to the world of nano. And this is one of those things where the topic just becomes an obsession, right? So you're always in. And I was I was doing economics, and I was uh, literally I was working for Pepsi, which is Pepsi is a wonderful company. I was I was producing potato chips. So as far as removed as I don't think no, yes, you can get, and and that is the craziness of my life. But it's still this topic of nanotechnology was like in my brain all the time, all the time. And and at some point, I think that you just get to the maturity uh, enough. And I wish this had, had come a little bit earlier, but to say. I need to explore this, right? So this is something that I need to spend time and dedicate time because if I don't do it, it's just going to be stuck in the back of my mind forever. And and so there came that point in time that, yeah, I, I had like this, but what it would feel like a very traditional career. And then all of a sudden is, no, this is not me. I need to really explore. And, and I was completely okay with failing. Uh, I think that it was more of this, I need to know, uh, not that it wasn't, it wasn't scary or anything. Not that obviously your family does this. It's not like, oh my God, what did you do? Uh, but, uh, but you know, when I ended all of that and I quit my job at Pepsi and then I said, I really need to explore this stuff uh, in, in, in nanotechnology. It just, uh, all that I knew was that it was an obsession. So mm. um, I, I feel also for entrepreneurs, I try to make sure that whatever they're doing, it really is an obsession. Uh, and it just it, then it becomes something that you you create no better things. Obviously, I, I saw opportunities because I'm uh, I'm from Colombia originally. So Colombia, I got to the point that I couldn't really learn anything more. So where can I learn more? Go to the United States. Met some wonderful people that that have been like my soulmates in in terms of uh, of developing new technologies. Um, and uh, and that's yeah, that's how it happened. So you know, I I think I. 
I encourage everybody to continue to to get that little little thing, you know, that little obsession, and give it time, give it a good time and a good effort. Um, and you know, something wonderful might come of it, and or might not, but then you won't have that thing on on the back of your mind. Yeah, great. Uh, I'm thinking, uh, why don't we go? We've got a couple of questions, and sure. uh, you know, I could just uh, read them out loud and. Uh, some of them, I think you've already answered. Like the first one, is it open to foreign students? I think you answered that. The question, the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So from the get-go, it was open to international students because we had to. It was a collaboration with Technion, so we had to bring some Israeli uh, founders. Um, and so we we basically just said, this makes a lot of sense. Why not? There's talent everywhere. So, uh, you know, we, we and, wish we had more, actually. Um, and do you do you function in a, uh, uh, a specific time period for start of cohorts, or do you take? Um... Yeah, we, we start in August, which is when the academic uh, calendar year okay. starts. So we do our cohorts every August. Uh, yeah, okay, so it's one, one cohort. So it's one cohort a year, starting in August. One cohort a year. Yeah, exactly. And, so and applications would be open until for the August cohort. Uh, for February fifteenth. So we okay. closed them, you know, a few months back. We selected for this year, and then we open uh, October for next year. So okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So 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 if anyone attending would like to apply, it would be for the August twenty twenty one cohort. Yes, exactly. Okay, mm -hmm. perfect. Super. Yeah. Um, and the that, other question that doesn't mean I would say that doesn't mean that we couldn't help you before that. And I've had a lot of people come to us and say, hey. You know, this is my this is my idea. How can I make it better? And I've worked with them, and we even had a company that um, you know it started working with us. And then when it came time to basically like be part of our cohort, they said, you know what, we're we kind of too advanced for you now. <laughs> we and that we they they actually had gotten more funding and everything. So you know that is awesome. That is awesome. The objective is not to be to have the uh, no, the objective is to help entrepreneurs. So every time that we can help them. Uh, that is the right goal. So if you, yeah, if they contact me first, I help them uh, build even from before. So the other question was uh, during the program, how can companies diversify their teams mm -hmm. uh, with members from scientific, but also other outside uh, academia? Yeah, so I'd say it is, it's not just puzzle during the program, I mean, it's fundamental. Uh, because most of the people that we bring are just come alone. You know, we, we had only one case that it was uh, two people, but this was because it was a, a couple, they were married and they were building the company and they both were PhDs, so very rare. Um, but, um, but for the most part, people come along. So uh, what we want that initial team and we help a lot with our network and this is a wonderful thing I think about being in New York, but now the world is really big, is you find a lot of people that either are young entrepreneurs that have the same MBAs or know some of the uh, well, so, so there's a couple of, of people that, that usually come in initially. So one is some that would do more business development, even though we want that PhD to be the CEO, right? So we're training that PhD to be the CEO, but we do, it's good to have some people that help them do the business development. We also sometimes just bring teams of very good software engineers, and that's something that uh, you know, Cornell has plenty of, so we find here in Cornell, Columbia, CUNY, um, there's even wonderful program of, uh, of undergrads, there's one called Breakthrough, Th Breakthrough Tech uh, of undergrad uh, women that are computer scientists uh, that are looking for internship opportunities, so we bring all of those in. Um, and, and, and they get usually you know, very, very nice, very high quality uh, technical, technical people and technical skills. Um, and then you will start growing from that. Uh, those are like the basic team. So we just reach out of our network. Um, it takes some time at the beginning. I think that making that initial team, uh, it's, um, it's, like getting, it's like getting married. Right. So, it, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it, it, or I would say like date, high stakes dating, right? So, <laughs> um, yeah. so we, we have two, uh, we have two questions that are, uh, adjacent topics, which is, you know, yeah. what are interesting topics or industry or technologies covered, uh, uh by your startups or programs. So, yeah. uh, and I think you partially answered that, but maybe you want to dive a bit uh, deeper. Can you answer yeah, software so generally speaking, right? 
Exactly. Yeah. So software, generally speaking, uh, an IoT is is included in that if there's a strong software component to it. So uh, I would say we want things that are in general related to machine learning. Um, it could be some type of media, augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, signal processing, computer vision, natural language processing. So those are um, sort of the, the, the biggest things. Usually all of that gets encompassed into AI. I kind of think, you know, AI is used in, in I think sometimes in BS way. So I don't like saying AI, but it's mostly all digital type of type of tools and technologies. And what we want is people that are developing some unique uh, twist to it and, and something interesting. So right now, for example, in computer vision and natural language processing, you could use off the shelf uh, things that you know you go to hit GitHub or what AWS has or what Google has. So that's not bad for a company, but that's not <clears throat> what we're looking for. We're looking for someone that would come in and say, okay, I, I need to solve this problem. It cannot be solved just by off the shelf components. Maybe I can inform myself on that, but there's a little bit of twist of that. So uh, that's what we're looking for. I think eventually, one thing that I that I think it's been pretty interesting for us is um, doing predictive analytics because that always takes some twist. You know, it's not easy to do predictive analytics in many spaces, so that always takes some development. And the other one, what I call signal processing, you can think about it, information processing, is either how do you get a better output with the input that you have, right? So that's that's about making a better algorithm or how do you get the same, at least the same output with less information? That also takes a better algorithm. So if you're developing a better algorithm, I think that that fits pretty well, yeah. So the other question was uh, advice for PhDs that are a few years out of academia and interested in working in deep debt but need not have strong basis from one of their own research? Um, so, I'm, I mean, I'm not sure what, uh, what it means if it's, uh, you know, working, just working with a, with a company or actually building a company, right? So yeah. those are two, two different things. Um, you know, I think that it's, it's okay if you are, uh, for, for us, it's okay if you're outside of academia. I think that that is actually why we try to build this program also is because too many people don't recognize that doing entrepreneurship is not a bad thing, right? And uh, we still have that thing that 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 uh, someone in academia would take a look at your CV and say, oh, you've been doing, what have you been doing for two years? You're not in academia, so therefore you can't continue in academia. Uh, and that's why we built this as a postdoc program. But in general, I do believe that it, it doesn't matter, you know, you uh it, it's it's fine if you're a, a couple of years out and i would say if you don't have a strong technology and uh, and it okay i would say it's not really about the technology is find the value proposition that's really what matters if you are able to find uh a problem and you think that you can that, that there's a solution that would really make an impact to that problem then you can go back and say, okay, do I have the knowledge or don't I have the knowledge, right? You would be surprised at how many companies get built with amazing value propositions that the technology is not as complicated as they thought. You know, I had a lot of PhDs that, that come in and say, oh, I can build this, this is not a big deal, right? I didn't have to do 600,000 lines of code. <laughs> so, uh, because they figure out it was actually quite simple. You know, as academics, we tend to think of things that are way more complicated. Um, but you don't. So that's one case. And the other one is if it is complicated and you do need to build something that is, um, that might be a little bit more technically complicated, then find your soulmate, find the technical soulmate that helps you. Uh, because I always also say, you know, you're building a company, you're not building a you yourself, right? Company is there in the world. You need to be accompanied by someone. So go and find people. Um, and that means talking to people. So yeah, I mean, my, my, I think, you know, one of the things uh, I've seen uh, with often with PhDs is uh, solutions searching for problems, you know, yeah. and, uh, you know, you can work a long time in academia on something that is intellectually interesting, but that's not solving a important problem in the real world. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, so I think to me, my advice is always try to uh, try to find, try to find a problem first. Yeah, for sure. And the other one is don't assume what the problem is either, because 
uh, I've, I've done this. I literally spent three years developing something in a lab and I'm like, oh, this is going to solve that problem. That's great. The problem was real. Uh, I was just under estimating how important the problem, <laughs> overestimating how important, how important that problem was. And then I came out and whap, nothing happened. So uh, yeah, so that, that's the other thing is talk to people. If you talk to people, they will help you understand uh, what the problem is and how to solve it. Yeah. So the other one, I mean, I think we've already alluded to it, but you know, I'd be interested to get, uh, give it another swing because uh, it's, it's a problem that I'm personally struggling with is, mm-hmm. you know, when do you draw the line? And, you know, it's really hard to, I mean, the ideal situation is, you know, this uh, convergence of, you know, uh, I think that we've exhausted uh, the possibilities of business, the bu- building, building a real business. And the, the founding team comes to the same conclusion at the same time. But, you know, in fact, it rarely happens, right? I mean, uh, we're, we're more experienced and we tend to come to this conclusion a lot faster because we've seen so many businesses and we have so many patterns of successes and failure that, you know, when you accompany founders, it's really tough to get them, get them to the point where, you know, I think you've been working on this and there's no traction, right? So, yeah. you know, and that, that's the part I'm struggling with. One of the parts I'm struggling with the most with, you know, what I do on a day-to-day with District 3 and, you know, my coaching and mentoring, generally speaking. So I'd be super curious how you deal with that. Yeah. Get your advice. Yeah. So, so what, are we, what are we trying to do? Uh, yeah, that is a constant struggle for us too. And I think it's, um, you need to make data-driven decisions, which is, is not Fernando telling you whether you should continue or not. That is not Fernando telling you. And I do see the patterns, so you're right. You know, we, we, we're sort of like there sitting and, and seeing, seeing these things. But, uh, but at the end is, look, if you're not getting traction, is really what are your customers saying? You know, what, what are these, these initial potential users saying? And usually it's pretty straightforward. You know, whatever, if, if you're not getting traction is because they're, you're building something that they don't care about, uh, or usually it's because it's like a nice to have, you know, and people are also saying, like at the beginning, all of them are, are saying, oh, this feels interesting, but no one is going to tell you that's stupid. You know, don't do it. So, um, so you end up building something that is a nice to have as, an, as opposed to a must have. So I think what I really do is I always push them on that is what you're, is what you're building a must have, which means that the dynamic changes. If you're building a must have, people will connect with you. They will seek you. So your customers will seek you. You is not really selling. I mean, they would, they would go and say, okay, why haven't you solved this problem, right? Because I really need to, to solve it right away. It's like with COVID, right? We needed to solve it right now. It's a must have, I need to have this right now. So, um, so the dynamic completely changes and also the customers not only are more engaged, but they, they really start going along the ride with you. And even if you fail in some timelines or delivering this or the product is not perfect, they're okay with that because it's still moving towards where they need it to be. So I just push them, always tell them, okay, are you really building a must have? And show me the data that, 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 that says that you're building that. And if they are, I guess the, I just try to uh, show them the dynamic, how different the dynamic is. Yeah. Uh, so we're starting to run out of time. So I'm just scrolling through the questions. I mean, one of them is, do you have to be physically present uh, in New York City? And, you know, in the context of COVID as well, right? So there might be uh, two, two answers there. Uh, no, the answer was uh, it used to be. So uh, I, don't, I don't know anymore because uh, I guess, uh, uh, you know, when things open, then uh, we might, yeah, we might say yes, but now uh, we're doing things virtually. So uh, we'll see. I think, you know, this is one of those things that COVID really changed. Uh, our and, 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 and how would you deal with, you know, a founding team in Montreal that, you know, it's the beginning of their career, don't have a lot of money in their bank account, you know, moving from Montreal where the rent uh, is, uh, is affordable, uh, you know, where you have um, uh, socialized uh, health insurance and, you know, then moving to New York City where your rent is probably 10x and, yeah. uh, you know, you, you need to pay insurance to start your business, you know, without any funding. So how does that typically go for your founders? Well, well also, so that is why programs like ours are, are helpful. I mean, we do actually give funding. So we do give okay. money, right? So we don't bring people just like, hey, come and see what happens. So we give we give the salary, uh, we give health insurance. Uh, actually, we pay for immigration as well. Uh, 
and uh, and we have housing resources here which are uh, a little bit better than market rates so yes new york is an expensive city for sure okay. and uh, and i've i've built companies in much less expensive cities where you know i didn't even have to pay that much rent uh, but also the network that you get here it just accelerates things like crazies so uh, but in this new covid world we'll see what happens uh, i'm i'm absolutely opening uh, to to new ways of working Yep. And and so maybe one last question, which is of interest to me as well, and uh, which is uh, how are your companies doing? Um, uh, how are your companies performing uh, nowadays in this market? Yeah, and, so uh, you know, and and maybe you know, what did you do to help them adapt? And which ones are performing better than others? What are the criteria? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the, the program has been running for about uh, now six years. Uh, we've had uh, 26, uh, sorry, 20, uh, now seven companies uh, uh, with us. Uh, and we have, we measure ourselves against uh, building high tech companies. That is what Cornell does, right? So Cornell usually, they, they've had more years doing this and, and they have about a 4% success rate, which what, which is what you would really expect of uh, of these very intense uh, technology type of companies. Um, we have right now about a 75% success rate. Um, so it really is you know, dramatically different. And success by, by success, we mean either our companies are funded uh, for two years uh, for what they need to operate. They either are acquired or sold, which we have done too, um, or they're actually operating in an unsubsidized environment uh, with revenues, right? So uh, by those metrics, actually, the, the program is going pretty well. Uh, in terms of COVID, we had a couple of companies that I think was an initial shock, uh, particularly in construction. I think that that was pretty difficult because sort of like all of a sudden it stopped and it was difficult to, um, to get access to construction sites, but that is coming back online. So we see that perfectly well. We had some working on health. Those are booming. That's just going nuts. So we had, we had one working on infection disease um, detection in hospitals. So you can imagine that company is just right now growing like weed. And then we had, uh, and then we had some other ones working on services. Um, uh, we, had, we have one in particular that is doing the uh, backend platform and analytics for wine shops. Uh, and they had a 1,500% uh, increase in sales in one day. <laughs> so, you know, during pandemic, we actually drink uh, a lot. So they're doing pretty well. Uh, they're pretty resilient. Uh, and uh, I think if you build a, a necessary technology, uh, you know, this, you, you either change a little bit or pivot, not super strong. We've never seen, we haven't seen any company completely die and we haven't seen any company completely pivot. We've seen them actually uh, deploy the technologies uh, still in the right way. Excellent. Uh, any uh, other uh, comments or uh, uh, Fernando that you'd like to add or a question there? We're running, we're out of time. Mm -hmm. So, but maybe you want to pick one up that uh, you feel is uh, particularly relevant. Uh, yeah, no, I'll, tr I'll try to like quickly go through and answer some questions, you know, in the chat so that uh, we, we get everybody there. I'll also put my, uh, my email uh, for anyone that wants is Fernando at Cornell, that is you. I make it simple. Fernand Remember the Fernando, that Fernando at Cornell? <laughs> That's me, Fernando at Cornell. So um, I, all, I think I just leave uh, people and uh, people that are attending here with a message and is, uh, I know that some of you that are attending this or you would know someone that is in academia that wants to build a company and that it feels this, not only the frustration, but also the lack of community. Uh, and, but I want you to know that you're really not alone. Uh, what District 3 is doing also is a big part of this. You're not alone. There's people that want to help you. There's mentoring, there's resources. Connect, talk to people, you know, be take that take that really that that skill and that little passion that you have and talk to people about it uh and for the most part what i've seen is this wonderful community of entrepreneurs and mentors and people that we just want to help you you yourself jd you're also that you know you want to help you want to be very honest and eager in helping uh, people and companies so i think that with covid uh what we realized and we knew it from before but is uh, we transcend uh, barriers, we transcend uh, countries. Uh, and so if you want to talk and you're from anywhere in the world, you can do it. You can connect with people. 
and we'll help you as much as we can. So just, uh, you know, um, be, be honest and try to connect and, uh, and good things are going to come your way. Right. And don't be afraid of being uh, one, not knowing. I think that's important because we also don't know a lot of things and Hey, I felt like crazy. So I can tell you stories about all the failures, So not knowing and failing is really not that big of a deal. Uh, and, uh, but you need to talk about it. Right. So if you're afraid of failing, then talk to people. If you don't know things, then talk to people and learn, uh, and, uh, and let us just be part of the journey. Fernando, thanks a lot for your time. It was uh, super appreciated. And, uh, you know, hopefully uh, we'll get uh, the chance to have our two organization collaborate. Uh, I think it's great value added uh, for uh, many of our uh, startups uh, currently in the program to, uh, you know, to join forces and uh, not join forces, but, you know, participate in your program as well. Yeah, no, thank you so much for, for inviting me to do this and, uh, and for connecting. And absolutely, I mean, the background will We'll start uh, working on, on interesting ways of collaborating. So um, this is just the beginning, which is awesome. Thank you, Gislen. I think you're a new Gislen. Sorry. So thank you, JD, for animating this wonderful discussion with Fernando. We really, really enjoyed it. Um, thank you, everyone, for participating. I would like to bring back um, an important reminder. Join us next week for another District 3 Dialogue. Next week, we will have Ana Fernandez from our Biohub discussing with Dr. Camille Lebeck. He is a scientist, an entrepreneur, a consultant, and he will talk about synthetic biology and how uh, this uh, is related to sustainability and businesses. He will also talk to scientists that want to commercialize their research, and he will give a North America perspective for that. So join us by applying at this d3center.ca to our newsletter, and you will have all the information necessary. This um, conversation today will also be on our YouTube channel, so you can uh, share with your colleagues um, that would like to revise and also be inspired by what uh, by what JD and Fernando mentioned. I ask you Fernando and JD to stay while Rosa, she will close uh, the event to all the participants. Uh, I wish you all a wonderful day.